Hello everyone. Let's talk about documentary film pre-production, which I know probably sounds super boring. <laughs> and I think it's a testament to how we feel about, in, in, as filmmakers feel about the, the world and that we just call it pre-production and then production, you know, the three phases of filmmaking and then post-production. Like we seem a little obsessed with production as being the center of the universe and pre-production is just something you do before that. And post-production is just this thing you do after you've done the main most interesting thing, which is production. And that is um, kind of uh, telling, I think, about some of the problems that filmmakers can have. We get obsessed with production. We spend all this time filming stuff, but we didn't spend a lot of time beforehand thinking about why we're filming or what things in particular we want to get. And so you end up filming a bunch of stuff and you're kind of running around filming whatever you think is remotely interesting and then you get to post-production you gotta deal with all that and th that becomes a mess and it never gets done or your focus the documentary doesn't seem very focused so pre-production is incredibly important i think it's particularly interesting especially because there's a lot of ways you can screw up pre-production that will just you know have lasting impacts throughout the other two phases so it's, it's really important to to think about to increase the chances of success with your documentary film because you know a lot of films start out filmmakers start out with the best intentions they're super passionate about a subject they're gonna hit the ground running this has happened to me more than once and they got a you know awesome film they're gonna make and they just love shooting it and capturing all this stuff and but they don't really have a solid sense of what story it is they're trying to tell and it never gets finished and so if you saw it start out with a really good solid pre-production plan you really take that phase seriously it's it's going to help you a lot in increasing the likelihood that you'll end up with a well-produced finished documentary and so <laughs> what is pre-production well it's basically everything before production everything before shooting and i've heard it referred to as the building of the launch pad as in terms of trying to communicate how important this is you know you got your rocket and you want to send it off to the moon and do some amazing things with it. Well, you gotta get a solid launch pad going, otherwise it's gonna go off in the wrong direction or terrible things are gonna happen. So I wanna talk about some of the basic steps of documentary pre-production. And uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is brainstorming ideas and developing goals. And so, first off, you gotta have a pretty solid idea. And something that not isn't just a great idea but is an idea that you're incredibly passionate about <clears throat> so what are you really interested in learning about what story are you really passionate about sharing with other people and so some things to think about with that is how well does this particular subject fit the medium of television and film number one is this a visual idea so is this something that you can you can communicate this story in pictures. There are, you know, plenty of great, important stories that need to be told that just don't have great pictures to go with them. In fact, one of the reasons why I transitioned in large part from making documentary films to making documentary radio programs was because there were all these incredible stories that I really loved and wanted to share with other people that had no visuals for them. I had all these people up in Alaska who tell me these incredible things that they've been through. But, you know, from my documentary filmmaking perspective, there was just no really practical way to share those stories with people. I would have to do reenactments or, you know, create animations or, you know, stuff like that. It was just going to be really impractical. So I basically said all right forget the visual we're just going to go audio and so i started uh, a program called dark winter nights true stories from alaska which is a radio program that airs on the public radio station here in fairbanks kuac it's also on uh got a podcast there's more information on that at darkwinternights.com and so i recognized these were cool you know more or less documentary ideas true stories people were telling about experiences they'd had in alaska but they didn't have the visual side. So it was not gonna work real great for those to be documentary films. So the idea you have, does it 
you know, one one of the things I'm going to be thinking about when, you know, I, I hear about a documentary idea is, is there, are there natural visuals that go along with that that's going to make it particularly interesting? You know, one that I like to come up with, you know, talking about depression is an extremely important thing. It's a, you know, certainly a totally valid and important subject to talk about. But the problem with that is that the, the conflict really is, is pretty internal. There's not a, like, a lot of visuals you can do with that. I mean, you can show a lot of people who, like, maybe look depressed or something. But the vi how you communicate that in a visual form is going to be challenging, as opposed to, you know, a documentary about monster trucks or, you know, something incredibly visual, a lot of dramatic visuals going on. So when you're, when you're weighing, like, how, how solid of an idea is this for a documentary, you want to add points if it's extremely visual and there's going to be a lot of compelling footage to go with it. If you don't have that, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that you shouldn't make it. It could still work, but that's going to be a challenge for making it interesting if you don't have solid visuals to go with that. Another thing to think about is, is it dramatic? And, you know, drama seems like kind of a, a <laughs> ephemeral concept. Like, what do you, what do you mean by drama like it doesn't have like people dramatically dying or anything like that what what i really mean by that is does it have conflict because conflict is the root of drama so do you have opposing forces who are battling each other somehow and uh and in it for an important goal <clears throat> so for example um i uh, made a documentary about driving my 1982 delorean which is the uh, car from the back back to the future i bought my dream car a few years ago um in the lower 48 and then spent eight days driving it up to alaska with a buddy of mine and so what's the conflict there like i want to get to alaska the car <laughs> doesn't really have an opinion <laughs> no one on the way wants to stop me so why did i think that was a a good documentary idea in terms of this element of drama well the drama is, will the car make it? Or will we make it? You know, if this was a brand new car, not a lot of, you know, potential for it to, for you to not make it. You know, I guess there are some things you could run into an elk or have, maybe have some weird car trouble, but kind of unlikely. But a 1982 DeLorean, <laughs> there's no one for like thousands of miles who knows how to work on it. And I'm not a, fantastic mechanic myself so the drama for that was will it make it you know that's what sold me on the idea that one of that was one of the things that made me think that this was going to be a, a workable documentary up here i've had students try and do documentaries on transfer sites because they're a weird thing up here in fairbanks the places where people come and drop off they dump their trash but they also drop off things that they think other people might like or use that still have some life in them under an overhang and then other people come pick them up and take it it's an interesting thing it's kind of you know a uniquely alaskan thing so it's got some points for it there it's definitely got some visual going on but like where's the conflict um and there certainly are ways you could find some conflict because there are times where things get things have gotten dramatic <laughs> at the transfer site when you know some people get a little upset about you know what belongs to who and and some, some pretty nasty interactions but how are you gonna capture those so on his face a documentary like that has some benefits in terms of an idea but also has some drawbacks who's who you know and these are things that don't necessarily mean you can't do the documentary you just might like look for ways that you could incorporate them inject drama into your documentary i mean we watch reality tv do it all the time they fabricate drama in every episode you can make you can create dramatic situations all on your own so if you're doing a documentary about the transfer site maybe don't just make it about that but make a challenge for you know some people and you see this a lot in reality tv who you know take uh five different people and see who can make the most money off things they sell at the transfer site or who can make the coolest looking whatever you know and so you can you can create some things into a story and that's why understanding what makes for a good documentary is really important because you can kind of add these elements in 
if you want to, if it, even if the subject doesn't necessarily have a particularly visual element to it. Does it have an inherent plot is another concept here. And by that, does it, does the story you're telling have a, already have a very clear, like beginning, middle and end? Like it, it seems to be going somewhere and does it, um, do, does it naturally, or is there a way that the drama could kind of climax near the end of the story with then a little bit of resolution at the end and we'll, you know, get more into storytelling later but you know is there is there something about that that naturally fits that uh sort of plot structure um the other uh, so some things that fall nicely into that are <laughs> uh trips there's a saying in in the film world no film ever failed that took place on a train and the idea behind that is that audiences you know want to see if they make it to their destination that was one of the things that i knew was going to be an asset in the delorean documentary was people it's going to be hard for folks to start the documentary, see us embark on this journey, and then like quit and not stick around to find out if we made it. I knew that I had that. I knew that that was the big question that I could lure in my audience with at the beginning was, does the car make it? That's the fundamental question in, the, in my DeLorean documentary. <clears throat> and... You can see this in, in sports games as well. I mean, think of the most dramatic um, sporting events you've ever seen. There, there are games where, you know, um, two opposing forces who have completely opposite goals are going at, <laughs> at each other. And in the most interesting games, you know, they're, they're buzzer beaters or they're, they're um, tight right up till the, the very end when, the, when finally one team wins or goes into overtime or something like that. Those are the most exciting games. Games, uh, even though you got two people opposing each other, if one is just completely blowing the other one out, you know, people leave before the game's over. If it's a, uh, you know, basketball game and the score is 80 to 12 um, after the first quarter or second quarter, um, you know, who's who's really going to stick around except the parents of the kids, right? <laughs> so um, does does your story, like, can, can you see a natural way that the elements of your story could be organized? Um, and so this is easier with things that, for example, chronological order is a very, is an awesome way to be able to organize a story. So if your story fits that, that's, a, that's another plus in the good idea column. For example, I made a documentary about uh, World War II called Making Choices. It was about the Dutch resistance during World War II. And I just followed chronological order. Here's life before the war. Um, here's life when the Nazis invade the Netherlands. Here are the things that they did over the years trying to protect Jews and fight the Nazis. And then the end of the war when liberation comes and you know, kind of end with some brief ideas on what they learned and, and the lessons that they took from that experience. So. One of the pluses of that, it fits a real nice chronological um, structure. If you've got something that's more topical, like, you know, you, with a transfer site documentary, you could be like, you know, here are the dumpsters, here's the transfer site, here's the truck, you know, something that doesn't, isn't necessarily chronological, but it's about like the different topics, or maybe you're making a documentary about a city and you're just saying, now we're going to talk about this district, and now we're going to talk about this district. You can do it, those can work, but that's going to be a little bit of a challenge because the audience, it's not super obvious to the audience why we're going from one topic to the next and how long we should be in each one. That's the beauty of chronological, and that's why the vast majority of stories are told in a chronological fashion because audiences just get it. And so um, if, if your story can be told that way, that's great. If it ends up being topical, doesn't mean that it isn't, a good story and can't work but it's gonna be additionally challenging um, and then another tip that I've learned late in life is you, you don't necessarily have to lock into an idea and see it all the way through come up with multiple ideas you know especially in in the early phase if you've got you know a number of things you're you're thinking that you could make a documentary about explore them all and see which one has the most potential to succeed. Because sometimes you think, this would be a great documentary. And then you get into it and you're like, oh, you know, turns out it's not quite 
the story I thought it was. It's not quite as interesting, that kind of stuff. Um, and don't so don't be afraid to to pull the plug. This is something that I never really understood for a long time, until I had the opportunity to uh, attend um, uh, uh, one uh, event that Ira Glass from the extremely famous popular podcast radio show This American Life did up here in Fairbanks. And that's was sort of the first time I'd heard the idea of coming up with an idea, exploring it, maybe doing, even doing interviews, talking to people, getting a, a solid feel for it, and just being like, you know what, I don't think there's anything there, and moving on to something else. I had always played like, I'm doing a documentary about this, come hell or high water. <laughs> and you end up, you know, you could es essentially end up throwing a lot of good money after bad, or maybe in most sense more like, good time after bad you investing a lot of time into basically an idea that you see isn't necessarily going where you want it to or or anywhere super valuable so don't be afraid to explore ideas but then pull the plug if you don't think it's going anywhere um so keep that keep that in mind and as you're uh as you're talking with people and and making contacts you know just make sure to to play it safe and let them know that you're exploring this idea. It may not happen. And uh, that way they won't, they won't maybe feel so bad when they find out, like, you know what? I just couldn't figure out how to make, make this one work. So you've got some possible ideas. They s seem to be passing or, 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 or doing fairly well in these basic tests of is this something that would make for a good documentary. The next step is that you should research it. And... Again, it should be something that you are so interested in that you are thrilled <laughs> at the prospect of looking into this as much as possible. You know, I was so interested in what happened in the Netherlands during World War II that I studied Dutch for two years. <laughs> I actually, like, got good enough that I had a conversation in Dutch in the Netherlands when I went to visit. I actually went to visit the Netherlands. I bought, you know, every book, every documentary I could find, watched it all, read everything I could about it, because I was just super, super interested and passionate about it. And that's the kind of feeling you should have for a documentary that you're about to work on. It should be exciting for you to find this stuff. And so, um, if start to research it, and if it's, if it's not exciting to you, if it feels like work, then let's, you know, let's hope we can find something that's more interesting to you, something that falls more into your, your particular hobbies or interests. Another thing I would recommend is watch every other video you can find on this subject within reason. So you know what other people have done and maybe you're just telling a story that somebody else has already told better. So why would people watch yours? I'm not going to make a documentary about a president. <laughs> Any president. <laughs> because I don't necessarily have any resources or access or anything of that nature that would be better than what people who have, who have already made documentaries about those presidents have, you know? So, I mean, I certainly could make one if I wanted to, but I can pretty much guarantee you there's almost no way I could make it better than documentaries that have already been done. So research it and I know it can be a little bit scary you don't want to watch something and and then feel like you're going to copy it but you you really should see what else is out there so that you know what kind of competition that you have and also can learn more about the subject matter for me one of the things that sold me on the Dutch resistance documentary was I like could not find anything else there's plenty 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 as you probably know probably millions of hours of documentaries about World War II in general I couldn't find anything, any documentary, except one that was like, I think made in Canada and I don't know if it was made that well. And to get a copy, I actually had to contact the production company and order one for a ludicrous amount of money, like $130 for a VHS tape. It still stings me a little bit because <laughs> now I think it's finally back in distribution. You can get it for probably like 10 bucks, but that was the level of commitment I had to seeing what else was out there. But I, I knew, like, you know, if HBO had come out with a 12-part series on the Dutch Resistance during World War II, maybe that would have discouraged me a bit. Now, you know, there are copycats, and people are that interested in it. Maybe 
there's a way you could tell the t story differently and there could be you know a huge fan base for that and some but how are you going to tap into it differently than what what's already out there so that's another thing check out has this story been told can you do it better or differently than them how is yeah how is my, your version of this documentary going to be different the more you understand this topic and the story the better you can tell it you can ask more inf informed in uh, questions of the people that you're interviewing. Interviewing tends to be a really big part of, it's kind of the bread and butter of documentary filmmaking interviews. Not always the case, but a lot of times it is. So you can ask those people more informed questions. You can find better people to interview, better contacts. You have a better san sense of what drama might be occurring. So really understanding the subject as much as possible is going to help you tell the story better. So those are some things to, to think about. Another thing to think about in pre-production is what kind of equipment are you going to need to tell the story? And your subject is going to have, this, the subject of your documentary and how you're going to shoot it, it's going to have a big impact on what gear that you're going to need. So for example, I've done a fair amount of documentary filmmaking in little villages around Alaska where you're flying in in tiny little single engine planes and you can carry, you know, like, 50 pounds of stuff with you or something down those lines. So I can't bring every possible bit of gear I'd want to. So you have to think about what is the absolute critical gear that I need to bring in order to film effectively in this location. So, you know, tripod, camera, of course, all the media SD cards and all that, which are good and small microphone, audio gear, <clears throat> lighting. Usually I didn't bring. And so I just have to work with natural lighting. You could bring one, one light, and do it that way that's how i've lit this interview i just got one light that i really like and and that can help a lot too a lot of times i just went with natural lighting <clears throat> and i knew enough about lighting that i could go around and find places and 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 make it work most of the time sometimes there's some lousy lighting as a result years ago and i'm sure this <laughs> subject will come up because this is my never finished documentary i wanted to do a documentary about uh the Model Railroad Club in Fairbank, because I was really intrigued with Model Railroad stuff. I'd had them as a kid, but never really got very far with them. And so I was like, I wonder what these, these guys have got to be interesting. And so one of the things that I realized was that if I'm going to tell a, a, doc, a story about model railroading, I want a little camera that I can put on the, the train and drive it around. So I bought one of those cameras um, back when they were really lame and <laughs> shot really terrible footage so but that was a piece of equipment that I that was sort of uniquely needed for that project that I'm not going to need for I'm not going to need a micro camera for a vast majority of other projects for the documentary uh, about driving the DeLorean I knew I was going to need all kinds of suction cup mounts and GoPros to put on the car I got a dash cam for the car so it was always filming the front of the car I figured if I got in an accident that would be horrible and tragic, but at least I would have it on camera. <laughs> what I didn't realize that was especially helpful with that dash cam is it's always recording audio too. And so there was one key moment in the documentary where the DeLorean breaks down and I thought I had it on camera somewhere, but when I went back to look at the raw footage, I couldn't find it, but I have the audio of me calling my buddy on the mic, um, on the radio and saying, we got a problem in the DeLorean. So that dash cam saved my butt and I got, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of footage of <laughs> the road, which I can use for, for B-roll and whatnot. But that's also a camera that's pretty specific to that particular film. So what kind of stuff are you going to need for that? Um, and then if, if you can use lighting and audio gear what kind of lights are you going to use how much crew are you going to have because the more gear you have the more trouble it's going to be to set up and move it around if you got just one light pretty easy if you're going to do three four five lights it's going to take longer to set up and potentially more people to do it but it's going to look great and uh, what about audio are you just going to clip a microphone on somebody or you hate how it looks to have a microphone on someone in documentary it's generally considered fine to show the microphone but if you don't want to for some reason you're a purist you could have a shotgun mic or is someone going to hold that are you going to have it on a stand 
shotgun mics are great uh, in many ways for recording interviews, but they, again, are, are more work too. So, um, yeah, and if you're filming outdoors a lot, you know, you're going to have different lighting needs than you're planning on filming indoors and all these things. So, unfortunately, there's infinite <laughs> different things you're going to have to think about in terms of the gear that you're going to need for your project. But this is one of the things you want to be thinking about in pre-production and make sure you can get the gear that you think is going to be really important. And that's another good reason to watch other documentaries on that subject because maybe you'll see like, oh, they used GoPros in this. That's a cool idea. Maybe I'll do that too and whatnot. Um drones you know i knew that i was going to want to have a drone for the delorean documentary because <clears throat> i was going to want to show the car driving down these highways in the gorgeous natural scenery of canada so had to have drone and those shots are pretty awesome those kind of a pain to you know stop and get it out and figure out how to film so another step in pre-production is to write a production plan Generally here, we're speaking about a treatment synopsis and budget. <clears throat> and the treatment is basically a paper proposal for your film that generally is used to send to funders. So they can look at this paper and they can get a sense of what your film is going to be about, what characters you're going to interview, whose point of view it's going to be from, um, and whatnot. So it's basically, you know, a, a a paper-based pitch for your film that allows people to get a pretty good sense of what the film is going to look like because you can imagine if you're making jaws or you're making schindler's list like how do you communicate to the audience how different these films are <laughs> you know there's there's a lot different a lot of different things going on with pacing and music and of course schindler's list is you know in black and white for the vast majority of it and these sort of things so um, that's the idea of a treatment and there's all sorts of explanations that um, I can provide you with for like what needs to go into a treatment if your project is not going to be funded if you're not seeking funding it's one of those things that's nice but not per not necessary per se it kind of depends on the sort of person you are there's a lot of stuff you could do that would make your documentary better. But if all of these tasks end up killing <laughs> your motivation and your ability to actually finish the documentary, then, you know, what, what, what good are they? So yeah, if you, if you're not looking for any funding, but you want to, and you want to make this documentary, you didn't necessarily have to jump through all the hoops of doing a real official treatment, but you do want to come up with a basic idea of what it is the the story is that you want to tell and how you want to tell it you know how do you want it to look is it going to be like quick cuts and wacky angles or is it going to be really more um <clears throat> textbook documentary filmmaking style these are things you have to figure out because you don't want to like improvise this in the shooting and change your mind <laughs> halfway through or anything like that um and so um it's you should do something if you're not going to do a full treatment do do something so that you have a sense of what it is you're making before you make it one of the things that that can be helpful and isn't quite you know isn't as much uh, isn't as labor intensive but it's still really tough for beginning filmmakers to come up with is a synopsis and a synopsis is a generally one to two sentence description of the film you want to make. And the the problem is that sometimes when especially with documentary filmmaking, you're not always sure what film it is you're making. You know, with the Dutch Resistance documentary, I didn't really know what the film was necessarily gonna be until I got into post production and started putting this together and I was like, Oh, this this most powerful moments, you know, seem to be re related around this theme. So I guess this is kind of what we're going to do. It's one of the kind of cool things about documentary, but it's also terrifying at the same time. And it's one of the things that I really envy fiction filmmakers about is that, you know, they got the script. And so they know pretty darn well before they go shooting what they need. So it's way more efficient 
or should be at least <laughs> in many ways in documentary we're just kind of filming all sorts of stuff not sure what's what's going to work and what's not and then when it comes to editing you know they've got the script it's it's way more straightforward it's almost like paint by number <clears throat> but with documentary i like to tell people it's kind of like taking five different um jigsaw puzzles and mixing them all up into one pile and trying to make one good looking puzzle out of it <clears throat> excuse me so that's that's the challenge and the, the the less pieces you have to deal with the better and that's one of the areas where the synopsis can help so it should be very specific and these are important for documentaries of any length and so for example if you have a synopsis that's like you know the um, this documentary is going to be about baseball obviously you could see that is way too broad you could cover any number of things and make an infinitely long documentary about that so that's a terrible synopsis but a synopsis that said this documentary is about the final game in the 1984 world series now we've shrunk it down to something way more succinct and clear and now the beauty of the synopsis is this thing when it's done well should be kind of like a, a beacon off in the distance that you can focus on and follow and and this comes uh, from something i heard uh read when i was a kid i think it was uh a native american story about two guys who are trying you know betting who can walk the straightest path through the snow and so one guy you know like looks down and he's putting one foot in front of the other and the other picks a point in the distance and walks straight toward that and as you can imagine the person who picks that spot in the distance and walks straight toward it has the straighter line than the one who's too focused on the, on feet so that's what that synopsis should be for you it should be that point in the distance that helps you progress toward this specific goal so you know a documentary about that particular world series that's a that's a pretty narrow point in the distance a documentary about baseball <laughs> you know this is like you can go any one of these directions you don't know what you should film who you should talk to who you shouldn't talk to you know if, it, if you've got a good synopsis it should do a great job of saying ignore all this stuff focus just on this and that makes it more practical to to complete that so that's sort of a, a basic introduction to what a synopsis sh should look like and then uh the third part of that the budget and the problem with budgets is that in my experience artsy people are not interested in accounting and sometimes vice versa this seems like pretty commonly human brains either lean toward like math and numbers and those details or lean toward art and my mind is totally toward art toward art i hate <laughs> the budget stuff just the idea of budgets like makes me upset and bored <laughs> and so they're brutal and so it's a kind of a cruel thing that you know documentary filmmakers often have to like go through the hassle of trying to figure out like how much is this going to cost and so you might say well i you know i i don't have a budget i'm not gonna get any funding or i don't have a whole lot of money but if you really want to do the documentary well there are some things you should shell out for you know otherwise like it's not really gonna go very far if you want it to go very far and it doesn't necessarily take that much but you know even a no budget documentary can end up costing some money and so you you might want to have a sense for like how much am i willing to put into this and if you are really looking to take a big swing at this and you do want to look at funding it's going to be good for you to know how much funding you may need and you know present that to potential funders and so when you say like i'm gonna want five thousand dollars for this like why what are you gonna spend it on you say well this 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 and this and as you probably know budgets are always uh, an estimate and they can definitely go over a lot of the time but that's one of the things that um is just par for the course when it comes to it so some comes to filmmaking or a lot of things <laughs> that involve money but for example uh you might think about travel so are you going to be having to drive anywhere or fly anywhere and pay for gas and that kind of stuff and some of this if you're really serious about it and want to kind of make a business of documentary filmmaking and deduct some of this stuff from your taxes 
you can. You can write down mileage and whatnot that you're incurring as you go around filming folks. Um, closed captioning could potentially be an issue if you want this to be distributed widely. And, uh, you know, there's on, on TV, there's going to be a, a fair number of TV outlets who are going to say, I'm only going to air this if it's closed captioned. And that's uh, could potentially cost you some money. Um, festival entry fees. If you really want to make a name for your film, you really should enter festivals. And those, depending on, you know, if you're entering as a student or entering just in the regular category, vary in, in price a lot. But, you know, the expensive and, and well-known ones can be expensive. You know, we're going to be talking about $50, $70 per pop. Kind of depends, again, on, on how renowned the uh, film festival is that you're entering. But if you make this great film and you want people to know about it, film festivals are the way to go. And if you're just entering free and cheap ones, you're not going to necessarily <laughs> get into uh, get get the attention that you may want. So that's something to think about. Um, if you want to pay for advertising after you've made your film, and if you get distribution and you score something cool like that, it's possible that you can avoid some of these expenses. But that's that can be kind of tough to get. So you're going to buy social media advertising. You're going to pay to have a trailer for your film put on YouTube, that kind of stuff. It costs money. And what about a website? How are people ever going to find your film if you don't have a website? Well, that's going to cost you money too. Even if you do it yourself, you're going to have to pay for um, the server fees and the, and the domain month by month, year by year. And it depends a lot on which service you use. But, you know, I'd say, what am I paying now? I've, Feel like about 14 bucks a month but it's gonna vary a lot um, and, you know especially if you're if you're buying a fancy domain and I'm not always getting the best deals I think on my web hosting but you know it's gonna cost you but it's 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 kind of necessary if you want anyone to be able to find your stuff so those are just some examples of expenses you might have even if you're planning on this being a no budget documentary and there there very well could be more maybe there's some gear that you feel like you need to be buy specifically for this project that kind of thing so how much will it all cost this is going to be good for funders some funders only fund specific uh costs too i mean i found when i made a, a documentary um about the alaska natives in the kodiak region of alaska the alutic people and how they were starting to rebuild their traditional culture, um, traditional arts, uh, dance arts and mask arts and that kind of stuff. And uh, we we got funding for that, but one of the funders, which is an Alaska-based funding agency, didn't pay for travel. Travel was just not an expense they would pay for, which seemed really unfortunate since if anyone should understand how important travel is to tell a story in Alaska, it would be an Alaskan-based you know, funding agency, but they wouldn't pay for it so they'd pay for other stuff and uh you know whatever closed captioning whatever expenses we other you know some of our other expenses that we had but they weren't going to pay for us to go anywhere and that was that was i i'm sure our biggest expense so having just a general sense of what this may cost would be good um it's definitely going to vary project by project i feel for you if money and this kind of stuff is not something that you really love thinking about but it's a uh, it's a good thing to to keep in mind because if you run out of money or you know go into debt or something like that it's not that's one of those launch pad fails another thing to think about in the pre-production process is scheduling when are you going to be shooting when are you going to be editing when are you going to have a finished project um, product to show people when are you going to have maybe like what we call a sizzle reel or a little promotional video or a trailer or something of that nature. When do you think you would like this broadcast? If you're aiming for having this broadcast, generally speaking, you know, public television is your best option for that because they'll air locally produced stuff. Most other channels, you know, can be a, a <laughs> real tough to get on broadcast TV. But uh, so, you know, is there anything, any particular time that would be good for this film to be done by? For example, with my Dutch Resistance documentary, there was an anniversary. I, 
might have been the 60th, I think it was the 60th anniversary of the liberation of the Netherlands. And so I, you know, scheduled the documentary with my public television station to air on that day. And so it had to be done by then. And, you know, audiences generally are in the mood for different subjects at different times of year. I heard from a uh, programming uh, director at that particular station, um, WGVU in Grand Rapids, Michigan, that uh, people, according to her, people like to watch things about snow and summer. Like they're hot, they're uncomfortable, and the, <laughs> it makes them feel better to watch something cold <laughs> on TV. So when your film finishes and what time you're, when you're aiming to get a broadcast could be impacted by things like that. Um, and when can you, you know, tell participants that they'll get copies or, you know, a link or something like that? Because this is what everyone is going to ask you when, if you're doing interviews and anyone who's working with the film is going to want to know, when is this thing going to be done? And I can tell you from personal experience, setting deadlines for yourself, scary deadlines, hard deadlines, you know, making commitments is really important to finishing the project. Because if you if you don't set deadlines and no one is really you know like paying you or forcing you to finish the project, high likelihood you'll never finish the project. So keep that timeline in mind and tell be feel accountable. Tell everybody this film is going to be done at this time. All your friends have them nag you, you know. Um, what's also worked for me too is some film festivals will take projects as work in progress. Work in progress. And so your, your film isn't finished, but you you s plan on having it done by the time, you know, or obviously before the festival occurs. So you, you want to show it to them. And, and I've had films, one film, the, the um, it was a documentary about a building on campus, um, University of Alaska Fairbanks campus, actually, that I submitted as a uh, work in progress. Anchorage Interna International Film Festival took it. Um, and then I was like, oh, man, now, now I actually have to finish this thing. It was good motivation. So what's, what's your schedule for this? And this, again, can help with some production issues because if you say, I'm shooting until this time or, you know, you got a good sense of, like, why you would film until this time. Is there some key period in the, in the documentary subject that it makes sense to start and stop filming? Then... Uh, that's you know another thing that can help you to be accountable for finishing the film. And so yeah, and so that's terrifying too, and hard. And one of the tips I'd give you for actually finishing the project is, well, the, for a number of reasons, t tell everybody you know that you're working on this. A because you might find that people you know have leads that can help you out, but also it's the accountability. You need people nagging you. It's it's hard. And maybe your personality is a little bit different that you don't need, you know, you just finish things because you're a finisher, <laughs> you know, that's cool. But people like me, to really make good continuous progress on it, we need a hard deadline and we need people nagging us to make it work. And so the, the films I've finished, it was because of nagging or is it because it was a very hard deadline, that kind of stuff. Um, and the films I haven't finished a lot of times is just, I didn't, nobody necessarily cared that much if I finished it or not. And there was, yeah, and I just was, you know, kind of fell out of love with the, with the subject, got tired of it. It's one of the main, one of my main concerns with documentary filmmaking is, is finishing the film before you just can't, can't take it anymore. Uh, number fifth element here of pre-production we want to talk about is choosing your interview subjects, which as you can imagine is extremely important. Because these are the people in a typical documentary who are going to be the foundation of your story and how, how you weave this story together, how strong your story is, is going to depend in, in a disproportionate amount to the people you get to interview. Um, depending on the subject, you know, the closer the people that, that you interview are to the core of that subject, you know, are these... You're doing a documentary about a particular event. You know, we can go back to that World Series baseball game. If you can get the players, you know, interview those people, that's way better than just talking about, you know, interviewing his baseball historians or somebody who weren't wasn't there. If you can get uh, people who were, you know, uh, attended the game, um, you know, 
baseball managers, the, the announcer, all that sort of stuff. You know, these um, <clears throat> primary sources, people who actually lived through that particular experience have so much more credibility and will make your film so much more interesting to people than if it's all just people, uh, secondary sources, people who maybe heard about the game but weren't there, you know. So how many primary sources can you get if that applies to your documentary idea? And uh, some ways to, uh, you know, select people, you know, first, what, what kind of uh, connection are, are they at, really at the core of your documentary idea? Are they more peripheral or, you know, once you get out here, it's just like anybody can talk about anything. So you want to get as close into the experts, to the people who are primary sources to build credibility with your your audience your audience is going to see like oh wow you know i should listen to what this person says because they're clearly extremely knowledgeable about this you can evaluate people you know if it's some people you probably just have to take if, if they happen to have the knowledge in their head that you really need but if you're you know if there's a number of different people who could work to be interviewed on your subject maybe a number of different experts on a subject that uh um maybe semi interchangeable one of the things you can do is to pre-interview people so you know contact them see if they're interested in the film <clears throat> and uh just talk with them over the phone or maybe meet with them and and talk with them a little bit to learn more about what they know a little bit and also a little bit about you know maybe how they present themselves because we are in documentary filmmaking we still have to be kind of entertaining and it's a little bit of a battle between you know being educational and being entertaining the perfect documentaries are both they you know have a heavy component of like teaching us things and, and we're learning about the world but they're also entertaining to stick us around so we can't keep us around so we can learn so when you're looking at interview subjects and you got a couple of different people who you know are generally interchangeable in terms of what they know which one seems more passionate which one is going to come across better on camera that kind of thing and so you can you can figure that out in a preview and you also might find that <clears throat> maybe someone who you think knows something about a subject doesn't know as much as as you would like and sure would stink to to tell them you want to interview them about something show up with a camera and then leave going well we got nothing out of that because they didn't know anything that's what a pre-interview can do. <clears throat> there are some like pros and cons to that in terms of, you know, you might get people's hopes up that they're going to be in a documentary or not. So you want to be, you know, very clear with people all the way through. Say, I don't know, you know, the documentary kind of um, tells me in the editing room what it wants to be. So I can't guarantee anybody will be in a document in the film or not. You know, some people get excited about being in a film, and I made that mistake. I, you know, you want to say something nice to a person afterwards. You say, "Oh, for sure, I'm going to interview you. For sure, your interview is going to be in the final film." Then you find somebody better, or you find out that your film is way too long, and you have to cut huge parts that you really wanted to keep in, but you, you can't help it. Then um, that's going to sting. So do your best to not get people's hopes up too much and make it clear you don't really know who's going to be in it or not another thing to consider when you're looking at who to interview is who's who's the audience going to relate to best other people that are are more um you know friendly cheerful interesting maybe people who are a little monotone aren't so great so you are casting a little bit here too and so you know, when possible, that's that's something to consider as well. When, again, when these are people who are, you know, gen, when you've got like generally kind of interchangeable people. If you've got a primary source and that person is the only person who is there, it doesn't matter how boring that person is, they're going to have to be in the documentary um, if you want to do it right. Just maybe not as much of them. And then find other interesting people who are kind of related who can spice it up a little bit. The other thing that you need to think about when you're looking at <clears throat> who you want to interview is whose point of view do you want to see this film through. For example, you know, I've had students who do documentaries about mixed martial arts and they tend to focus on the fighter, the man or woman who's going in the ring and trying to pummel someone else. Um, but 
so that's one version of that story. But imagine if the point of view was through their spouse or partner or child and how that changes the tone of the whole film. So who, you know, who you interview is going to have a big impact on whose eyes the audience sees this story through. So, <laughs> and I think as you start to learn about how films in general are made, you start to see like there's a tremendous amount of ethical decisions you have to make and the tremendous impact and power that you have over this story just by selecting who you interview, who you don't interview, which ends you up in this landing at the bottom of this whole debate, which is what is truth? And that is not something that I'm going get, to get into right now because that's a whole other um, can of worms. All right, so who's, whose perspective do you want to tell the story through? And, and, and that's one thing that might evolve. You might think it's going to be through this one person, but in editing or in the process of making the film, you find like, oh, actually, the perspective of this other person is more interesting. But it's, it's something to consider, and that's something that you would talk about in the, in the treatment as well. And then another thing that you want to do here in, in pre-production and throughout the production process as well is establish a, a relationship with your characters and participants. Now, a, a lot of these tips are kind of general documentary filmmaking tips. If you're doing an expose about something, you know, it's possible that developing a, a good friendly relationship with people is unlikely or impossible or maybe undesirable. But in a general, in your typical documentary where it, you're just trying to tell a story and you're not necessarily doing some sort of investigative report that's going to get people put in jail or companies bankrupt or whatever, you want to build a strong relationship with your subjects because that's going to make them more willing to work with you and open up with you more. <clears throat> used to use a textbook in my documentary filmmaking class that uh, was super dense. So nobody read it, so I got rid of it. But it did have some really good uh, quotes in it. And one of them that I really liked, uh, the author was Rabiger. I can't remember what his first name was. But he said, Part documentaries are only as good as the relationships that permit them to be made. It just might give you a little clue about why I got rid of that book, because that's a little like, that's pretty dense. <laughs> but so what does it mean documentaries are only as good as the relationships that permit them to be made? That means that your documentary is only as good as the connection you have with the subjects and, and what they give you. So imagine that you're doing an interview with somebody you've just met and you have very little in common with and they don't know you and um, maybe they're not that comfortable with you what kind of stuff are they going to give you are they going to you know tell you deeply personal things they're going to you know keep you at arm's length now imagine you're interviewing you know a family member or best friend or something of that nature a coworker you've worked with forever they're comfortable with you they're going to be much more willing to share deep things and potentially very personal things so that's why these relationships are, are very important. And so that means, you know, being friendly with this person, being likable with this person. I've found that just in the process of interviewing someone, people will really warm up to you as well because people like it when someone is really interested in who, you know, things they've experienced and, and what they have to say. That's incredibly flattering for most folks. Most folks don't get a lot of that. <laughs> I mean, you want to charm someone, just in today's day and age, just be very interested in who they are and why they're, why they're doing things a certain way and asking questions and making them kind of putting the spotlight on them. A lot of times that charms the socks off people. And, and people, we like people who are interested in us because, if, hey, if they're interested in us, then they must be smart people, right? So uh, you could do some of that ahead of time with, with pre-interviewing. And some of that will happen in the course of an interview if it is someone that you, you've just met. Maybe you want to interview them multiple times if that works out. And you might find that the more you interview them, the more comfortable you get. I've had all kinds of experiences like that. Doing this documentary in, the, in Kodiak about the uh, Alutic people. You know, the first time you go down, you get some interviews. It's okay. But who is this person from, you know, Fairbanks? I mean, at least we're from Alaska. But... 
you know, who are these people? Why, what is, what do they want to do? And then you come back a second time. They're like, Oh, you're back. Like, Oh, okay. That wasn't just like a come down once sort of thing. And you see them a second time and a third time. And pretty soon they're helping you. We had a problem when we screened that documentary. One of the bits of feedback we got was you don't have any elders in this film. And we were like, we tried to get elders, but we couldn't get any Alaska native elders to talk to us. And they're like, we'll get them for you. And these people got them for us. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about with the relationships that permit them to be made. We had a good enough relationship with the people that we interviewed that they became sort of like producers for us or fixers, another uh, term, you know, a local person who sorts out stuff for an outside crew, that they brought us the elders, they legitimized our, our project, and that allowed the documentary to be better. So that's what we're talking about with um, the relationships that permit them to be made. So that means it's really important when <clears throat> you first talk to people, when you do interviews, to just be engaged and work on making that connection with them because that's going to improve the quality of your film. Okay, and then another element with all that, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but I want to, um, in, mo in more detail, um, in the later videos about conducting interviews, but um, personal releases. So... These are little forms that you need people to sign that say, I give you permission to use my interview in your documentary. And it's uh, legally important for you in case, which is, it's never happened to me, but in case you make a documentary and somebody later is like, oh, I didn't know I was going to be in this. I'm angry or I want money or something because there's boatloads of money in documentary. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic in case you're not sure. Um, and so the personal release is something that allows you to have a legal document saying, you know, I agree to have my interview in this documentary. And so I have copies of those, uh, samples of those that I can make available for you too. Okay. Another thing to think about in pre-production is looking for funding. You might think like, I'm nobody. I've never made a film before. Nobody's going to want to make this film for me. That def or help pay for this film. That does hurt. And that, that not like, likely to help, but I wouldn't necessarily rule out funding. I've gotten funding for student projects because the different companies were just so excited about this particular idea. And it, it was particularly helpful when we could tell them this program is going to be on the public television station. So, you know, less risky for them. We got, you know, I helped the student raise, I think it was, I mean, this is years ago, years and years ago. It was like a thousand dollars for his project just by calling up local businesses and saying hey got this documentary we're gonna make and uh would you like to throw some money at it and we'll put your logo in in it and thank you at the beginning end of the film now if you're looking at having this film made for public television they have some very strict rules about that and briefly speaking you cannot have someone who fund the documentary who has a clear interest in the subject of the documentary itself so, for example, for that student, we learned this the hard way, for that student, we got one of the people he interviewed owned a company and was willing to provide funding for it. And the public television station was like, no way, because it looks like they're paying for this film to be made. And public television is all about none of this commercials, none of this, you know, pay to play kind of stuff. So the stuff that we got from completely unrelated businesses, you know, fuel companies and and whatever else that were never referred to in the documentary was fine, but that particular one, they're like, you can't take money from them. So we couldn't, which stinks. So think about that. And even if you're not on public television, if you're making a documentary about climate change and one of the funders is Exxon, that's just not going to look good. <laughs> so when you're approaching folks, just think about... Um, is this something that's going to work if I want to air this on public television? Is this something that's going to work? Uh, is it going to look just like a conflict of interest? Um, so that's that's one way you, you can go. And, and, you know, one of the things that gets easier with time is if you make some films and they do well, maybe they get into festivals and whatnot, that's going to build you some credentials that will make it somewhat easier for you to find funding in the future. Although I've heard stories about, like, world-renowned documentary filmmakers who still struggle to find money sometimes because there's just not a lot in the United States. Um, other countries, Europe and stuff, 
their governments have a lot more funding for arts than than we do so it's one of the challenges of living here um and then of course you've got the crowdfunding options too and your success in that is going to depend on your subject matter how many people would love to see a film made on that so it was like a niche group especially one who's familiar with things like kickstarter and indigo indiegogo that would want to help fund it um you got some a lot of family and friends who would love to see it made so there's there's ways that can work if you can hit you know that niche spot like you have access and ability to make a documentary about something that a, a lot of people want to see made it hasn't been made yet and maybe those people are somewhat you know techie or, or whatever that they're familiar with these these sites that's one way you could go as well and of course that like you know costs you nothing but one of the tricks with that is you know you have to think about what am i going to give people if they donate 50 bucks and how many make sure that i come through on that so that's that's a pain you can also just look for an organization with money that has a very specific or uh, obvious interest in your subject matter so um but then you got to watch about that conflict of interest too but you know if you want to do a documentary about depression and you wanted a hospital maybe to provide some funding for it you know that's okay if you're not especially if you're not referring to that hospital in the film that could work you could always contact the public television station in your area uh, about you know some of these ideas beforehand hopefully they'll give you the time of day um but that's another way to go so when i uh, was working on my dutch resistance documentary i started that film a single man um living in my my parents cottage I was paying like next to nothing for rent with a full-time job benefited job so i had money <laughs> i had like no expenses <laughs> so it was no problem i was like money ah what is this it means nothing to me and by the time i finished the documentary i was married i had a house and i had a kid i was broke and i was still going through grad school <clears throat> i was broke and so i approached an organization for that particular um that i had some connection with uh for that film it was the dutch international society which was an organization in in west michigan i won't bore you with the details of what they existed for and went out but they had money i knew they had money and i knew they like kind of didn't know what to do with it because i was familiar with their organization and so i went to them and i said hey like, give me i forget even what it was five thousand dollars um and i and i will make this film and you know put your name on it because this is clearly you're interested in dutch stuff this is about dutch stuff i never talk about your organization in the film so there's no conflict of interest it wasn't like they had any say in what i put in the documentary so that was totally cool and because you know i i was a, a video i had a video producer title but i wasn't necessarily like i didn't have like a bunch of documentary films to my name yet this was my first real big one that i was doing myself I said to him, here's what we'll do. You just set aside, I think it might've been three grand. I can't remember. You just set aside this money. I will give you receipts and you can pay me back. So you don't have to just give this dude who you kind of know three grand and hope he spends it the right way. Like I will demonstrate that I'm using this for project stuff. And that's the way it worked and it worked great. So, you know, you can be creative with these, with these things as well. And even if you think your film doesn't necessarily need money to be made like would money hurt <laughs> money means maybe you can hire someone to do something you're not so great at money means maybe you can buy some gear you couldn't before and money adds some credibility and man i tell you when i got that first time i got money for a project i was thrilled i was i mean i think i had a party to celebrate and it wasn't even that much money by my standards now but back then it was like what someone is willing to give me money to finish my like i've like i felt like i made it you know so yeah it's pretty pretty cool uh you know personally i'd be a little nervous about asking family and friends but that's up to you um and sometimes it can be easier to get money after the film is finished which i know seems kind of funny like why do i still need money but you might need money for festivals and all these other things so say look i made this film I'd love to assign your name to it. Here it is. You can see it is done. You don't have to worry about me finishing it. Um, 
so will you give me money and you know that's a safer bet for them um, but generally speaking it is easier if you have a nice job title job titles can carry a lot of weight for people when they don't know you um, another thing to keep in mind is recruiting a crew so is it possible you could get some people to help you with this you know do you have someone else you know who's really excited about this do you have friends who might be willing to join you even one other person if you could get one other person to help you especially on interviews that's huge because a lot of times when you're con conducting an interview you're trying to divide your attention between the camera and the person and that just that gets really tough it can be done but it's it's really challenging if, if you can have someone else who's even just there i had i recruited someone just for for my subjects to look at I mean I was asking the questions it was just it's easier for people to talk to a person than it is to a, like the dead black eye of a camera um, looks sort of like a like a great white <laughs> eye or something it's just about as scary for some people and it's also generally rude to you know be looking at someone oh interesting oh and so if you can't do that I'll, I'll warn my interviewee I'll be like look I want you to know I'm super interested in what you're saying, but unfortunately I have to divide my attention between the cameras. So, you know, if I look away, it's not because I'm not interested, it's because I'm trying to keep on top of the tech and just keep looking at me. But even with that, when people see you look away, do we just subconsciously interpret that as a, I'm not as interested. So can you find somebody who, who would come along with you on shoots? That would be fantastic. What things that documentaries need do you not do well? For example, I, I can do a lot of stuff. I can shoot, do audio, you know, produce, whatever. A lot of this stuff I can handle, but I can't do music. I'm not going to make, I'm at least not going to make a good music track for my own project. So I can go get stuff, you know, and that's a lot easier today than it was when I first started out. Um, but do you know someone who knows music who could make a custom soundtrack for you and have it be good? That would be awesome. What about web design? Or could you get somebody doing social media for you? You know, there's a lot of tasks that aren't necessarily that technical that people could help you with as well. Um, graphics, you know, a lot of cool documentaries have really elaborate graphical, uh, you know, 3D animations and whatnot, which make them look a lot uh, higher production value, like it costs a lot more. You know anybody who can do that? or just graphic design in general that they could make uh, you know a poster for you or if you're gonna make DVDs still or or you know um, yeah could they could they design one for you or even just research you got somebody who loves research who could do some research for you all right now uh, I know I've been talking a long time but we're gonna switch gears a little bit here and we're almost done we're gonna talk about some problems you can face in pre-production and <clears throat> these are problems I have personally experienced and have some painful <laughs> memories of still. So this is real world stuff that can affect you when it comes to the pre-production phase. Um, partnership. I'm sure you've heard more than one story of two people coming together on a project they're both passionate about that ends up tearing apart in disaster. And I've had that happen many, I don't know about many a time, but definitely some very dramatic ways Partnering with someone else on a project is really helpful because you can get it's incredibly more efficient use of time and, you know, um, productivity can go way up. And so there's lots to be gained by partnering. The problem is <clears throat> there's lots that can be lost, too, because you're kind of building this thing together. And how is it going to work if you decide you can't get along and disagree and tear things apart? In situations where partnership failed for me, uh, it was generally personality based. Um, I have high expectations of personality for people. I don't have a lot of patience for, for people I think are schmucks personally. If, if, if someone can like scream at you and you're okay with it, you're going to be a lot better off than me when it comes to, uh, partnering. Like how, how do you do on confrontation and, and how do you deal with other people? And are you a screamer, um, and yelling at people and cussing them out and stuff? Or are you a really calm low-key person and does this other person have those same traits if you're like me a calm you know not very uh, non-confrontational person and you partner with someone who is confrontational um it's not going to work well i can tell you from personal experience 
The other thing that's not going to work well is when it's kind of unclear, like, where does the buck stop? Who's making decisions? When I've had partnerships that worked at least well enough that the film was made, it was because there was a clear, like, separation of authority. That person was a producer. They had these decisions they could make. I was the director. I had these decisions I could make. It also worked because, you know, sometimes I just didn't care about the subject as much as the other person did. You know, if you're both extremely passionate about the subject and have very strong feelings about how it should be told, that could be a problem. If one of you is really passionate about it and the other one just like, yeah, yeah, whatever you think. In my opinion, that's likely to be a, a, a better uh, combination because if this person's like, this has to be this way, and the other person's like, yeah, whatever, that's fine then you're probably going to be in, in pretty good shape. But, you know, there's a lot of complexity that comes along with relationships, good or bad. You know, it could be that having somebody push you push back on you could be good too, you know. Um, and, you know, if, you get the, if the person you're partnering with just really doesn't care at all, that could affect the, if they stick with the project and quality of work that they do. So partnership, one area you can have a lot of trouble. Lack of focus. This, you know... This, I've struggled with this before, too. This is what affected me pretty badly with the Model Railroad documentary. I did not, by any means, have a beacon. That Model Railroad, I mean, that synopsis for that film was like, I'm making a documentary about the Fairbanks Model Railroad Club. That seems specific. It was not specific enough. And so I just got into, like, filming everything. And, and then after a while, I had tons of footage, and I really didn't know where I was going with it. And so... You know, it, it just, like, I, that story, I just couldn't, like, figure out what is the story here and what direction is it going to go. And I filmed a lot of stuff that, in retrospect, I was like, ah, what? Like, I really didn't need to do that. In the end, I think it would have been successful if I had just focused on this one person who was particularly interesting and uh, I thought did well on camera. And, uh, yeah. And so that film might someday still get made. We'll see. I got all sorts of footage. And then, you know, there are other elements to that too, but that film would have done a lot better if I would have done some research first, done some pre-interviews, gotten to know people, and said, okay, this film is about this and this, and not just gone and filmed everything that had to, that they were doing. It was just too broad and, and it lacked a lot of things too, like, you know, potentially conflict, and the structure was tough too. So at the time that I made that film, I didn't have a really good sense of, a lot of stuff we're talking about right now that makes for a good documentary. So that lack of focus is a major problem. Getting people behind you can be tough too. You know, people are busy. Why do they Why do they want to help you with this project? So you can be persistent but polite. If you've got strangers you're trying to get access to to help you get on board, maybe you can work laterally around stuff. So maybe there's one person you'd really like to talk to about this project, but they're you're not getting anywhere with them. Is there someone else you could talk to to kind of get around that? Because, you know, one of the keys to a great documentary is access. Can you access the people, places, material you need to tell the story really well? That's why I'm not going to make a documentary about the presidents is because I don't know any presidents. <laughs> and I don't, I mean, I know one person who knows a president, but not well enough. And yeah, anyway. Um, so if you can't get access, that's going to be a real issue for you. I hope you understand what I mean by that. Like, can you get to the core of what this story is about? <clears throat> so, um, if you're having trouble doing that, you know, persistence can be helpful. Coming back to them, coming back to them, showing that you're really committed to this and, you know, maybe you're a little bit irritating. My favorite example of this is a student who made a really cool documentary about the Letters to Santa program in North Pole, Alaska. And I wasn't super thrilled with this idea. I didn't know how he was going to pull it off. And he did, and it's great, and it still airs like to this day on the KOAC public television station here. I mean, because they're just dying for like Christmas-based material, especially local stuff. And there was a guy he really, really needed to interview for that. It was, I think it was the guy who was like in charge of this whole program, and the guy would not give him the time of day. And so finally, I, I believe he just camped out in the guy's office and waited for him to come back. And finally, you know got the interview i was really impressed with the, with this student's determination and the guy was fantastic and makes the whole film without him there's there's basically the film would have been 20 percent as good the best moments of that film the most memorable stories he told were all from this guy 
who was really great on camera, but really unhelpful at, at first with making this, getting this film made. So, yeah, it, it could be, you know, it's one of those things you have to use your own judgment on. If you keep knocking on doors and they never open and they never open and they never open, at some point you might want to pull the plug and say like, well, that's just a project I couldn't get anywhere on. Depends on how passionate you are about the, about the subject. So those are some things to think about in, uh, in, in pre-production. And one of the, the main ones that I recommend you really get comfortable with is that uh, synopsis. And that's, if you've never done a synopsis before, I can almost guarantee you're going to have a lot of trouble with it at first. But eventually, it'll start to make sense and it'll become clear. Figuring out that balance of like what's too broad, what's maybe too specific. Generally, it's <laughs> it's a lot easier to go too broad than it is too specific. But finding that, that kind of perfect window so this thing becomes a beacon and throughout the process of the film helps you understand I'm filming this because it fits my synopsis. I'm not filming, it, filming this because it's outside the purview of what I want to talk about. So there's pre-production. Hope it's not too terribly boring. Hope I've at least conveyed how incredibly important it is to do this right. If your idea of pre-production is throwing the camera in the car, you're going <laughs> to gonna have trouble. Because if you just run out and start filming stuff, you're going to end up with hundreds of hours of footage that you're never going to want to edit and the film will never be made. And I have seen it plenty of times. So give pre-production the attention that it deserves. <laughs>